Hi guys, I want to finish today the discussion of uh, HTTP and then uh, I think I'll post another lecture kind of introducing us to uh, concurrency. So this is the HTTP part. Okay, so basically HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol and it is used to fetch all kinds of resources from um, the web. So it basically organizes all the resources on the web under a set of um, addresses which can then be um, accessed through HTTP. Okay. Um, so it is part of or it is used by the by HTML hypertext markup language. Um, the two kind of work together um, and it's there again for for grouping objects as well as um, content that is contained in those objects. So the addressing scheme for this is based on uniform resource locators or uh, URLs, sometimes also known as uniform resource identifiers or URIs. Um, and the basic format for these is that you have some sort of uh, scheme through which you're connecting. Often this would be HTTP. This is kind of commonly what we see, HTTP colon dash dash, but um, there are other schemes that are possible as well. Um, and then you would have a domain and port. So the domain could be an IP address. It could be um, something like server.com. That's a domain as well. And then optionally, you can have a port afterwards. Generally, what we see is either just the domain or you have IP and port, um, but you can also have Kind of server.com and a port afterwards. For HTTP, it is assumed that the port number is 80. Um, so that's what your browsers will try to connect if you don't specify a particular port. All right, then you can specify a path for some resource. So this could be some whatever path to, and then uh, the resource being index.htm. Um, and if you want to pass some other parameters along with this, you can have a query string after um, 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 after a, a question mark where you would have some variable equals something else. So that's a query string. And then you can also have a fragment ID, for example, for finding anchors out of page. Okay, so all these things together um, can be a rel and most of the stuff is actually optional, right? You can just type in the domain and that's it, like google.com. Um, so nice things about HTTP is that it supports um, HTML, so you can have HTML pages, which then which em embed in them these resources, and then your browser implements HTTP to translate the links to these resources into, re into HTTP requests that actually delivers that content to your browser. Um, close my door here. All right. Um, so nice thing about this too is that you have a uniform a API for different platforms. So whether you're working with JavaScript within a browser, whether you're building something uh, on Python, whether you're using uh, TCP, all these things are going to have um, a uniform um, API for, for generating HTTP requests. Okay. And the other thing to remember is that this is a stateless protocol, meaning that servers don't remember prior requests. So if you send a request for, um, I don't know, this resource here, the server is not going to remember the fact that you asked this. So there's no context that's say, that is saved by the server on per client basis, um, which speeds up the the processing because there's less memory that needs to be devoted on the servers to processing these requests. All right. Um, yeah, so I think that that's about covers kind of the overview. So the way HTTP works is that you want to access some resource of this URL and to access it, you would um, issue a get request, which is um, one of the set messages defined in the HTTP protocol. And then your server might reply with an OK message and then the, with along with the data that you requested. So your browser would be able to interpret the OK message like, great, I'm getting data for whatever resource we requested and here's the data. And now let me pass it to 
the document object model, the DOM, and start rendering it. All right. So when you send a GET request, what you're actually sending is this string of data. So HTTP is a fairly old protocol, um, and so it's not very efficient at all, and um, it's in fact human readable. So there's a way to kind of compress this and send a lot less, a lot fewer bits to make a request, but for historical reasons, HTTP is uh, human readable, and so you're actually sending everything um, like this, which kind of makes it nice too because you can read it and see what's going on. So um, we can issue a GET request. We're getting this uh, particular object, index.htm, and we're going to use HTTP 1.1, and then we're going to create a new line with uh, carriage return and a new line. Okay, so this is kind of in Linux land, we need both of those characters to make a new line. Okay, then we're going to say, um, there's, we're accessing this particular host, so uh, the browser will know to where to open a TCP connection. Well, I should say that if we're accessing path to index.html, what would actually be here is the path to index.html, um, not, just, not just index. Okay, so we're connecting to this particular server. We can insert things like user agents. Um, we will accept replies either as text or HTML. Um, we can specify what language we're speaking. Um, we can have keep alive. We can have a bunch of other these types of headers that we can insert, insert here. Um, and then when we finish this request, we do a double carriage return. And at that point, that's a well-formed HTTP message, um, which the server can interpret and reply to it with an OK plus the data. Okay. So you can think of the um, HTTP message as, as having this format where we're going to um, have a, a method, then a space, then a URL, then a version, um, carriage return, and line feed. Okay, so this basically corresponds to this. So we have a method, which is get. We have the URL, which is this. We have, oops, um, we have space, then we have a version, H DDP 1.1, etc. Okay, and then we have the different headers with a value, which is the stuff we're passing here. So we have header and then a value and then uh, return and line feed. Okay, so instead of uh, method being get, you can specify different types of method. Okay, so get will actually download the resource. If you say head, you'll just get the resource metadata, but not the actual. Um, contain data. Um, you can specify post, which is if you're uploading something to the server, maybe uh, the user filled out a form and now you need to upload that form data, that would be done using a post request. You can specify put, which is for uploading objects to a URL. This is less common. Most web servers aren't going to accept put requests with you placing objects at some URL, but it's technically part of the standard. And then you can have a, um, a delete if you want to delete something from an object URL. So you can build pretty functional services where users can download um, data, send data to server either as forms or as actual objects or even delete objects. You can create kind of a Dropbox, Dropbox type situation where you can use put to upload a particular object. Okay. Um, and then once you send those requests to the server, you're going to get one of the possible replies. And there's many, many of them. But commonly, hopefully, you're going to get HTTP 200 OK. Right? And then you're going to get some data. And then connection closes. Okay? Other types of responses um, mention OK. You can get a bad request if the server can't parse what you sent in a new HTTP request. If the object doesn't exist on the server, it can get not found. This is pretty common. Um, you can get version that supported errors. You can get all kinds of different different things. Um, and there's a you know a table you can kind of look up what these different codes mean. So when your server says error error 404, well where does 404 come from? Well it comes from the HTTP standard where um, the server says I can't find that particular resource. Okay. 
Um, so HTTP will rely on TCP as the underlying transport protocol. So you can think of HTTP as a socket itself, but it's really just like a front for a socket. What it uses underneath is an HTTP is a TCP socket. Okay. Um, and so all the web transfers will actually rely on um, TCP congestion control and flow control mechanisms to not overwhelm the network. Okay. So it's kind of nice that way. Um, and then, you know, different languages are going to have different APIs for creating HTTP requests. So for example, in Python, because it's most readable, you can import an HTTP lib, um, and then you can create a connection to the server, right? So now you're getting a connection socket, just like we did for TCP, except now this is an HTTP lib connection. Okay. You can then issue a request, which is a get and a path to object. And the nice thing about the HTTP library is that it's going to understand that you're trying to send a get request to this particular object on a connection to this particular server. And so it's going to take this information and format an HTTP message for you. So you don't have to kind of roll it from scratch, All right? You get a response, you can read the data and close the connection, okay? Um, there's other libraries you can use URL lib. I mean, there's a, there's a few of them, right? Where, um, you can kind of more explicitly form your requests to, um, to the server where you can actually specify the address and a query string and all the kinds of stuff and then read the data. So many different options for writing your programs, including in, in C++. Okay. So when you create a read function, what will be the re what will be the reply here? Well, the reply will be an HTTP message, so maybe something like OK, in which case you would basically get um, some string of data that's that's human readable, which contains um, the fact this is an OK message and the fact that and, and whatever data that gets included in there. Okay. The one thing, the one other thing to mention about HTTP is the use of cookies. So you guys have heard of cookies, you have to accept them and you don't really know what it means <laughs> most of the time. I don't, I don't really know what it means most of the time. There's all kinds of cookies that are being, uh, that I'm being forced to take and um, I don't like it, but that's just kind of the fact of modern web. Um, but here's what cookies do. So as I mentioned before, HTTP is stateless, meaning that the server doesn't really remember any past requests that came from clients. Okay? But if you want the server request to work within some context, maybe you want to, I don't know, send your preferences to the server such that server functions do something according to your preferences or according to your location or according to... Uh, I don't know, the type of browser that you're working with, right? All that information has to get sent to the server every time so that the server has that information to, to pass it to its processing, right? And this, this wastes a lot of bandwidth because you keep sending the same data over and over again. And so instead, we're going to have uh, the ability to save some of the data into a database of the server. So not at the actual server running the HTTP process, but at some database attached to it, right? So you're sending form data, maybe this is, you know, your address, whatever else they, they make you fill out on your web pages. And then that data ends up, you know, being formatted as JSON or as rows in a database and stored in the database. All right. And now what the server is going to tell you is to say, okay, I got your data. Now save this cookie. Um, which is just an ID, okay? So your browser then will take that cookie and save it in a file. And then next time you issue a request, you're going to include your cookie ID in here, okay? And the result of this is that as this get request get to the server, the server itself is stateless, but it can take that cookie and look up all the data that it needs about you from the database and therefore you don't have to resend it again. You just kind of use this short cookie to find data in the database. Okay. Um, so the nice thing about this is that it's efficient. You just save some cookie and most of your data is here. You get to just send it once. Things are great. 
Where it becomes a problem is where servers are getting lazy and instead of saving all your data in the database, they're saying, um, I'm just going to push some context back to the user and have the user keep sending it to me. Okay, so they abuse the system and not only make you recent information, but they actually add tracking information about you into those cookies and make you resend them so the server knows all the tracking stuff it wants to know about, but it's making the user store that stuff. And so now your HTTP requests end up sending all kinds of information about you, which can be intercepted by others or read by others, all right? And this where this becomes a problem. So cookies are a great idea when they work as supposed to, which is just to uniquely identify your data on the database, and they're terrible when all kinds of stuff is being included and forced saved on the client by the server, and then there's security problems on browsers where different websites can start reading each other's cookies and kind of discover information about you. Um, so anyway, that's cookies. Great mechanism in theory ends up being abused quite a lot um, in practice. All right, I think that, um, yep, I think that about wraps it up. Oh no, we have uh, one more thing, cool. So um, let me check, this is the last thing. Yes, it is, okay. So the last thing about HTTP is, is caching, okay? And um, again, this is a problem with the HTTP server where because the server doesn't necessarily remember what it sent you, I mean, I guess it could kind of remember that using cookies, um, but if there are no cookies involved, um, the server just doesn't remem remember anything about you. And so it would be best if the server wasn't just sending you the same information over and over again. Um, right? Or if you have uh, multiple users in the same network accessing similar information, we may want to um, kind of save this information within the network somehow such that all of that, all of these queries don't need to go outside of the network um, wasting kind of our outgoing network bandwidth, okay? So this is where web caches come in. And a web cache is basically a uh, web server that serves data for multiple websites or for different URLs by caching it locally, right? So let's say that you are requesting index HTML and your request, instead of going directly to the server, it's going to go through a cache or you may actually be in many cases requesting data directly from the cache um, if your DNS request to the server domain actually gets routed to the cache IP address. Okay? And now that cache can decide if it has that particular URI, if so, it can send you back okay with the data or if it doesn't have it, it can reissue a GET request to the server, get the content, cache it, and then serve it. Now, any subsequent requests for that content are going to be served directly from the cache. Okay, so this is nice because your requests don't have to go all the way to the server, which may be, you know, like 80 milliseconds away, might as well go to the cache, which could be something like 10 milliseconds away. So your requests are handled more quickly and also if the cache and the client are in the same organization or in the same local ISP, there is less bandwidth going between the local ISP and the server, thereby serving the ISP money. Um, you know, there's all kinds of uh, schemes to distribute these caches. Um, mostly they're called content distribution networks. One of the common ones is um, Akamai or Limelight. And instead of having just one cache, they will have a whole tree of these caches that's worldwide. And so a cache, one cache might ask another cache for the content um, and so on and so forth. And only very rarely would the information, would the request actually go to the server, right? Um, one thing you can do is if you wanna, um, um, get the freshest data is to do a, a conditional get, okay? Um, so you can um, try to get the data um, if it has been modified since. So let's say that the, that the cache has saved some data on, I don't know, January 1st, right? And it could then issue a, con 
and then there's a request on January 2nd from the client to get certain content and the cache doesn't really know if it has the freshest content, right? So it could send a get conditional get request to the server saying, hey, send me the data back if it has been modified since January 1st, which is the time that I, the cache, got, the, got that copy of the data, okay? And then the server could send the reply saying 304 not modified and now the cache knows, okay, I still have the freshest data. I can send the, the reply back to the client that requested it from me, okay? So that way caches can keep serving requests from what they have, but they also know when the information they have cached has become stale because they can keep sending conditional gets to the server. So you can say, well, what is the benefit of doing this if we're still sending get requests to the server? Well, primarily it's that we don't have to do it every time. You can have some sort of time to live set on the cache. Um, but even if you're doing it for every possible get, this is still a much quicker reply, right? Because the server doesn't need to waste bandwidth resending you the data. It can just do a check on the date of the content that it has and say, nope, still good, not modified. You can serve what you have. Okay? So it's a nice mechanism built into HTTP to support caching at the edge. All right, and that's about wraps it up for networking. We will see a lot more of it in a lot more detail on TCP, HTTP, a bunch of other protocols in the networking course. I hope you guys take it with me next year. Um, and for now, we will just move on to uh, concurrency. So thank you.